They drove through the dark, dark forest. The carriage shone like a torch. Unfortunately, its brightness attracted the eyes of the robbers who dwelt in the forest shades, and they shouted... Gold! That's gold! gold. Forward they rushed, Uh, seized the horses, stabbed the outriders, coachmen, and footmen to death, and dragged little Gerda out of the carriage. And the old robber wife, who had a long bristly beard and eyebrows hanging like bushes over her eyes, cried out, She is plump! She is pretty! She has been fed on nut kernels! She is like a little fat lamb! And how smartly she is dressed! And she laughed and drew out her bright dagger, which glittered most terribly. But at the very moment she had lifted her dagger to stab Gerda, her own wild and willful daughter jumped upon her back and... Ah! bit her ear violently, and the little robber maiden cried out, She shall play with me. She shall give me her muff and her pretty frock and sleep with me in my bed. And so spoiled and wayward was this little robber maiden that she always had her own way, and she and Gerda drove off together in the carriage farther and farther into the wood. The little robber maiden was about as tall as Gerda, but much stronger. She had broad shoulders and a very dark skin. Her eyes were quite black and had an expression almost melancholy. She put her arm round Gerda's waist and said, She shall not kill thee so long as I love thee. Art thou not a princess? Gerda said she was no princess and told her all that had happened to her and how much she loved little Kay. The robber maiden looked earnestly in her face, shook her head and said, She shall not kill thee, even if I do quarrel with thee. Then, indeed, I would rather do it myself. And she dried Gerda's tears and put both her hands into the pretty muff that was so soft and warm. The carriage at last stopped in the middle of the courtyard of the robber's castle. This castle was half ruined. Crows and ravens flew out of the openings, and some fearfully large bulldogs, looking as if they could devour a man in a moment, jumped round the carriage. They did not bark, for that was forbidden. The maidens entered a large, smoky hall, where a tremendous fire was blazing on the stone floor. The smoke rose up to the ceiling, seeking a way of escape, for there was no chimney. A large cauldron full of soup was boiling over the fire, whilst hares and rabbits were roasting on the spit. The robber maiden said to her, Thou shalt sleep with me in my little pits tonight. And then they had some food, and afterwards went to a corner, wherein lay straw and a piece of carpet. Nearly a hundred pigeons were perched on staves and laths around them. They seemed to be asleep, but were startled when the little maidens approached. These all belong to me. And Gerda's companion seized hold of one of the nearest and held the poor bird by the feet and swung it, flapping it into Gerda's face. Kiss it! The rabble from the wood sit up there. Those are wood pigeons. They'd fly away if I didn't keep them shut up. Then the robber maiden pulled forward by the horn a reindeer who wore a bright copper ring round his neck by which he was fastened to a large stone. Here is my old favourite. We're obliged to chain him up or he'd run away from us. Every evening I tickle his neck with my sharp dagger. It makes him fear me so much. And she drew out a long dagger from a gap in the wall and passed it over the reindeer's throat. The poor animal struggled and kicked, but the girl laughed. And then she pulled Gerda into bed with her. Will you keep the dagger in your hand whilst you sleep? Gerda looked timidly at the dangerous plaything. I always sleep with my dagger by my side. One never knows what may happen. And the little robber maiden threw one arm round Gerda's neck and holding the dagger with the other was also soon asleep. One could hear her heavy breathing. But Gerda couldn't close her eyes throughout the night. She knew not what would become of her, whether she would even be suffered to live. The robbers sat round the fire drinking and singing. Oh, it was a dreadful night for the poor little girl. Then spoke the wood pigeons. We have seen little Kay. A white fowl carried his sledge. He himself was in the Snow Queen's chariot, which passed through the wood whilst we sat in our nest. She breathed upon us young ones as she passed, and all died of her breath excepting us two. Gerda cried out. What are you saying? Where was the Snow Queen going? Do you know anything about it? And the wood pigeons replied, She travels most likely to Lapland, where ice and snow abide all the year round. Ask the reindeer bound the rope there. Hear what he has to say. Yes, ice and snow are there all through the year. It is a glorious land. 
There, free and happy, one can roam through the wide sparkling valleys. There the Snow Queen has her summer tent. Her strong castle is very far off, near the North Pole, on the island called Spitsbergen. Oh, Kate, dear Kate. But the robber maiden threatened. You must lie still or I will thrust my dagger into your side. When morning came, Gerda repeated to her what the wood pigeons had said. And the little robber maiden looked grave for a moment, then nodded her head, saying... No matter, no matter. Reindeer, do you know where Lapland is? Who should know but I? There was I born and bred. How often have I bounded over the wild, icy plains? Listen to me, Gerda. You see, all our men are gone. My mother's still here and will remain. But towards noon, she'll drink a little out of the great flask, and after that, she will sleep. Then I will do something for you. When her mother was fast asleep, the robber maiden went up to the reindeer and said, I will unloose your chain and help you to escape, on condition that you run as fast as you can to Lapland and take this little girl to the castle of the Snow Queen, where her playfellow is. The reindeer bounded with joy, and the robber maiden lifted Gerda on his back, taking the precaution to bind her on firmly, as well as to give her a little cushion to sit on. And here are your fur boots. You'll need them in that cold country. The muff I must keep myself. It's too pretty to part with. But you shall not be frozen. Here are my mother's huge gloves. They reach up to the elbow. Put them on. <laughs> now your hands look as clumsy as my old mother's. And see, here are two loaves and a piece of bacon for you. So you won't be hungry on the way. And Gerda stretched out her hands to the robber maiden and bade her farewell. And the reindeer fleeted through the forest, over stock and stone, over desert and heath, over meadow and moor. The wolves howled and the ravens shrieked. A red light flashed. One might have fancied the sky was sneezing. And the reindeer cried out, look. Those are my beautiful northern lights. He ran faster than ever. Night and day he ran. The loaves were eaten. So was the bacon. At last they were in Lapland. They stopped at a little hut. A wretched hut it was. The roof very nearly touched the ground. And the door was so low that whoever wished to go either in or out was obliged to crawl upon hands and knees. No one was at home except an old Lapland woman who was busy boiling fish over a lamp filled with train oil. The reindeer related to her Gerda's whole history, not, however, till after he had made her acquainted with his own, which appeared to him of much more importance. Poor Gerda, meanwhile, was so overpowered by the cold that she could not speak. The Lapland woman fussed over them. Ah, poor things. You've still a long way before you. You have a hundred miles to run before you can arrive in Finnmark. The Snow Queen dwells there and burns blue lights every evening. I will write for you a few words and a piece of dried stockfish. Paper have I none. And you may take it with you to the wise Finnmark woman who lives there. She will advise you better than I can. So when Gerda had well warmed herself and taken some food, the Lapland woman wrote a few words on a dried stockfish, bade Gerda take care of it, and bound her once more firmly on the reindeer's back. Onward they sped. The wondrous northern lights, now of the loveliest, brightest blue colour, shone all through the night. And amidst these splendid illuminations, they arrived in Finnmark and knocked at the chimney of the wise woman, a door to her house she had none. Hot, very hot was it within, so much so that the wise woman wore scarcely any clothing. She was low in stature and very dirty. She immediately loosened little Gerda's dress, took off her boots and thick gloves, laid a piece of ice on the reindeer's head, and then read what was written on the stockfish. She read it three times. After the third reading, she knew it by heart and threw the fish into the porridge pot, for it might make a very excellent supper, and she never wasted anything. The reindeer then repeated his own story, and when that was finished, he told of little Gerda's adventures, and the wise woman twinkled her wise eyes and whispered thus, Little Kay is still with the Snow Queen, in whose abode everything is according to his taste and therefore he believes it to be the best place in the world. 
But that is because he has at last splinter in his heart and at last splinter in his eye. Until he has got rid of them, he will never feel like a human being and the Snow Queen will always maintain her influence over him. But canst thou not give something to little Gerda whereby she may overcome all these evil influences? I can give her no power so great as that which she already possesses. Seest thou not how strong she is? Seest thou not that both men and animals must serve her, a poor little girl wandering barefoot through the world? Her power is greater than ours. It proceeds from her heart, from her being a loving and innocent child. If this power which she already possesses cannot give her access to the Snow Queen's palace and enable her to free Kay's eye and heart from the glass fragment, we can do nothing for her. Two miles hence is the Snow Queen's garden. Thither thou canst carry the little maiden, put her down close by the bush bearing red berries and half covered with snow. Lose no time and hasten back to this place. And the wise woman lifted Gerda on the reindeer's back and away they went. Oh, I've, I've left my boots behind. I've left my gloves behind. The cold was piercing, but the reindeer dared not stop. On he ran until he reached the bush with the red berries. Here he set Gerda down, kissed her, the tears rolling down his cheeks the while, and ran fast back again to the wise woman as he had been told, leaving poor Gerda without shoes, without gloves, alone in that barren region, that terrible, icy cold Finnmark. She ran on as fast as she could. A whole regiment of snowflakes came to meet her. They were, in fact, the Snow Queen's guards. Their shapes were the strangest that could be imagined. Some looked like great, ugly porcupines. Others like snakes rolled into knots with their heads peering forth. And others like little fat bears with bristling hair. All, however, were alike dazzlingly white. All were living snowflakes. Little Gerda began to repeat, Our father. Meanwhile, the cold was so intense that she could see her own breath which, as it escaped her mouth, ascended into the air like vapour. More dense grew this vapour, and at length shaped itself into the forms of little bright angels, which, as they touched the earth, became larger and more distinct. They wore helmets on their heads, and carried shields and spears in their hands. Their number increased so rapidly that by the time Gerda had finished her prayer, a whole legion stood around her. They thrust with their spears against the horrible snowflakes, which fell into thousands of pieces, and little Gerda walked on, unhurt and undaunted. The angels touched her hands and feet, and then she scarcely felt the cold, and boldly approached the Snow Queen's palace. But before we accompany her there, let us see what Kay is doing. He is certainly not thinking of Gerda, Least of all can he imagine that she is now standing at the palace gate. The walls of the palace were formed of the driven snow, its doors and windows of the cutting winds. There were above a hundred halls, the largest of them many miles in extent, all illuminated by the northern lights, all alike vast, empty, icily cold, and dazzlingly white. No sounds of mirth ever resounded through these dreary spaces. No cheerful scene refreshed the sight. Little Kay was quite blue, nay, almost black with cold, but he did not observe it. For the Snow Queen had kissed away the shrinking feeling he used to experience, and his heart was like a lump of ice. He was busy with sharp, icy fragments, laying and joining them together in every possible way, just as people do with what are called Chinese puzzles. Kay could form the most curious and complete figures. This was the ice puzzle of reason. And in his eyes, these figures were of the utmost importance. He often formed whole words, but there was one word he could never succeed in forming. It was eternity. The Snow Queen had said to him, When thou canst put that figure together, thou shalt become thine own master, and I will give thee the whole world. 
and a new pair of skates besides. But he could never do it, and the Snow Queen said, Now I am going to the warm countries. I shall flit through the air and look into the black cauldrons, the burning mountains, Etna and Vesuvius. I shall whiten them a little. That will be good for the citrons in vineyards. So away flew the Snow Queen, leaving Kay sitting all alone in the large empty hall of ice. He looked at the fragments and thought and thought till his head ached. He sat so still and so stiff that one might have fancied that he too was frozen. Cold and cutting blew the winds when little Gerda passed through the palace gates. But she repeated her evening prayer and they immediately sank to rest. She entered the large, cold, empty hall. She saw Kay. She recognized him. She flew upon his neck. She held him fast and cried, Kay, dear, dear Kay, I have found thee at last. But he sat still as before, cold, silent, motionless. His unkindness wounded poor Gerda deeply. Hot and bitter were the tears she shed. They fell upon his breast. They reached his heart. They thawed the ice and dissolved the tiny splinter of glass within it. He looked at her whilst she sang her hymn. The roses bloom and fade away. Our infant Lord abides Then Kay burst into tears. He wept. <laughs> till at last Splinter floated in his eye and fell with his tears. He knew his old companion immediately and exclaimed with joy, Gerda, my dear little Gerda, where hast thou been all this time? And, and where have I been? Oh, how cold it is here, how wide and empty. And he embraced Gerda, whilst she laughed and wept by turns. Even the pieces of ice took part in their joy. They danced about merrily, and when they were wearied and lay down, they formed of their own accord the mystical letters of which the Snow Queen had said that when Kay could put them together, he should be his own master and that she would give him the whole world with a new pair of skates besides. And Gerda kissed his cheeks, whereupon they became fresh and glowing as ever. She kissed his eyes and they sparkled like her own. She kissed his hands and feet and he was once more healthy and merry. The Snow Queen might now come home as soon as she liked, it mattered not. Kay's charter of freedom stood written on the mirror in bright, icy characters. They took each other by the hand and wandered forth out of the palace. And as they walked on, the winds were hushed into a calm, and the sun burst forth in splendor from among the dark storm clouds. When they arrived at the bush with the red berries, they found the reindeer standing by awaiting their arrival. He had brought with him another and younger reindeer, whose udders were full and who gladly gave her warm milk to refresh the young travellers. The old reindeer and the young hind now carried Kay and Gerda on their backs, first to the little hot room of the wise woman of Finnmark, where they warmed themselves and received advice how to proceed on their journey home, and afterwards to the abode of the Lapland woman, who made them some new clothes and provided them with a sledge. The whole party now ran on together till they came to the boundary of the country, but just where the green leaves began to sprout, the Lapland woman and the two reindeers took their leave, and they all said, Farewell! 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 And the first little birds they had seen for many a long day began to chirp and warble their pretty songs, and the trees of the forest burst upon them full of rich and variously tinted foliage. Suddenly, the green boughs parted asunder, and a spirited horse galloped up. Gerda knew it well, for it was the one which had been harnessed to her gold coach. And on it sat a young girl wearing a bright scarlet cap and with pistols on the holster before her. It was indeed no other than the robber maiden, who, weary of her home in the forest, was going on her travels, first to the north and afterwards to other parts of the world. She at once recognised Gerda, and Gerda had not forgotten her. Most joyful was their greeting, and she said to Kay, A fine gentleman you are, to be sure, you gracious young truant. I should like to know if you deserve that anyone should be running to the end of the world on your account. But Gerda stroked her cheeks and asked after the prince and princess. They are gone travelling into foreign countries. Then Gerda asked after the raven. Ah, the raven is dead. 
The tame beloved has become a widow. So she hops about with a piece of black worsted wound round her leg. She moans most piteously and chatters more than ever. But tell me now all that has happened to you and how you managed to pick up your old playfellow. And Gerda and Kay told their story. The robber maiden sang gaily. Snip, snap, snap, Basila. She pressed the hands of both, promised that if ever she passed through their town, she'd pay them a visit, and then bade them farewell and rode away out into the wide world. Kay and Gerda walked on hand in hand, and wherever they went, it was spring, beautiful spring, with its bright flowers and green leaves. They arrived at a large town. The church bells were ringing merrily, and they immediately recognized the high towers rising into the sky. It was the town wherein they had lived. Joyfully, they passed through the streets. Joyfully, they stopped at the door of Gerda's grandmother. They walked up the stairs and entered the well-known room. The clock said, tick. Tick, and the hands moved as before. Only one alteration could they find, and that was in themselves, for they saw that they were now full-grown persons. The rose trees on the roof blossomed in front of the open window, and there beneath them stood the children's stools. Kay and Gerda went and sat down upon them, still holding each other by the hands. The cold, hollow splendor of the Snow Queen's palace they had forgotten. It seemed to them only an unpleasant dream. The grandmother, meanwhile, sat amid God's bright sunshine and read from the Bible these words. Unless ye become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. And Kay and Gerda gazed on each other. They now understood the words of their hymn. two happy ones, grown up and yet children, children in heart, while all around them glowed bright summer, warm, glorious summer. <laughs> 